diver glides over an expanse of bone white coral branches, recording the fish that dart between the ghostly arms extending from the sea floor off the Thai island of Koh Dao. I find it fun and I really like diving and it's just something that I can do that will have a good consequence for the environment and I enjoy it and I want to help the reef. After a two-week course in Koh Dao, the 14-year-old can identify coral types, carry out reef restoration, and help scientific research on coral health by recording the color and tone of outcroppings at dive sites. Coral bleaching has been recorded in more than 60 countries since early 2023, threatening reefs that are key to ocean biodiversity and support fishing and tourism globally. Worst affected are branching species that grow quickly, but are also less resilient. found since COVID is that's now, I, I, I've seen a lot of inquiries coming in, it's seven, six, seven, between six and eight, almost inquiries. It's like there's a, there's a, there's also a, a, an increased awareness and in, you know, whether it's the, all the news information around the world and there's obviously we're in a El Nino year and there's a lot of bleaching going on and there's a lot of concern about the marine environment. Um, increasing people's awareness. So we found an uptick and an uptake in, in conservation courses. And she is not alone. The Professional Association of Diving Instructors, better known as PADI, one of the world's leading dive training organizations, says conservation certifications jumped over 6% globally from 2021 to 2023. On Koh Dao, Black Turtle Dive offers courses on everything from how to properly dive against debris collecting marine plastic or stranded fishing net to coral restoration techniques. So of course we are not going to change the world, it's not like we are going to change things from one day to another, um, but we are doing our best uh, and that is like the best feeling, it's like I'm working every day to do something good for the environment and for the reef that I love. <laughs> And then in our little localised site, with good coral growth, we've seen fish communities bounce back. We have snappers returning, we have resident puffer fish helping to keep some of the biofouling substrates in check. And we're really seeing reef communities sort of come back to this very small area. Artificial coral reefs are dotted around Koh Dao, actively rebuilding marine habitats. And Nanolin's data on coral health is part of Coral Watch a global citizen science project that has produced numerous research papers. Like in the previous generations, we didn't have like this research and education that we have now. So I think, you know, people my age should make the most of it and try their best to reverse the things that have already been done because now we have the resources.
volunteers in Mabini have come up with a unique way to educate local residents about the importance of environmental protection by exchanging plastic trash for rice. Spearheaded by Julio Indaya and his group of volunteers, the Plastic Pallet Bigas, or a Plastic in Exchange for Rice program, involves residents of the town of Mabini exchanging sacks of litter collected from their beach, regardless of their weight, for a kilogram or 2.2 pounds of rice. This reward is enough for a small family's needs. Uh, so our, in our initiative, we exchange uh, coastal plastic pollution for rice. Uh, so we ask our local volunteers to help us clean the shores in exchange for rice. Mabini is a popular scuba diving destination located within the Coral Triangle, a global center of marine biodiversity that encompasses six countries, including the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. The area has seen an increase in the amount of trash washing up along its shores each year. So we have a lot of marine protected areas here, world-class dive sites, and uh, recently uh, an ISRA site, uh, important shark and ray area. So we have a lot of uh, critically endangered and um, vulnerable marine uh, wildlife here in this area. And the plastic can affect them a lot. Uh, they can get entangled. So I've seen sea turtles entangled in nets and other types of plastic. They've been known to eat straws and plastic bags. Uh, and the fish also eat microplastics that have been, you know, uh, broken down in the shore. Uh, and recently we've been finding more and more microplastics even in fish that we eat. So it's also harmful to us. The program has been a huge help to some residents like 46-year-old Janet Acevedo, who are having to cope with the increasing costs of basic goods like rice. Yung pong pagkapalit ko po ng bigas ay napakalaking tulong dahil sa isang buwan ay halos ay apat na kalahating kaban. Ngayon po ay dalawa na lang ang aking binibili sa laking tulong at tipid ng pagkapalit ng basura. At nakakatulong ito sa ating environment, ika nga. Sa ating kapaligiran at kalinisan ay talaga makikita. Dahil nakakatulong siya dahil yung mga tao, lalong nakaka-urge. Dahil hindi rin natin misa yung mga ibang tao, yung dala rin ang kahirapan minsan, lalo na sa panahon ngayon, ang mahalado sa mga bilihin. Nakaka-urge sila na sa kanilang free time, maglinis sila. May mga na, napupush ang kanilang sarili na maglinis sila dahil ano eh, may, meron silang matatanggap na something eh. Isa rin, malaking bagay rin yun eh sa isang tao. The Plastic for Rice Exchange aims to change that. A devastating ransomware attack has crippled critical systems, exposing sensitive data of millions and posing a severe threat to national security. A ransomware attack is not something to be taken lightly. I attended a cybersecurity escape room held by Kui City Ransomware Resilience Workshop recently in Singapore. We were divided into groups and was given different roles in facing a ransomware attack. James Blake, Kui City's Head of Global Cyber Resilience Strategy, shared more on the danger of ransomware attack. Ransomware attack is where an organized, uh, a, a criminal organization will encrypt your system 
Americans exfiltrate your data and then uh, threaten to release it and not give you the decryption key so it's no longer available. Prevention is incredibly difficult from a ransomware attack because the attack surface in most organizations is so broad. The biggest concern of government entities is they can't really pay. I believe you should never pay the ransom. You should build a level of resiliency to be able to withstand the attack uh, in, in a way that has the minimum impact on the organization. Hui City, as a global data management company, works with local governments in spreading awareness about the danger of ransomware attacks and advice on how to build a high resilient cyber security in facing this cyber attack worldwide. Uh, from this workshop, I I learned and I, I understood a little bit more about what happens when ransomware hap uh, when a ransomware attack happens, and then. Uh, so the situation room and how does the, the decision makers have to go into a room, they have to have discussions and ask each other serious and important questions and then come to decision. Yeah, so for ransomware attacks, I think it's very rampant right now. So we do know that it's occurring, but I do, do believe that businesses and enterprises will need to have more of the awareness of how they are tackling this situation. As technology advances rapidly, all organizations are increasingly vulnerable to cyber attacks. Therefore, it's crucial to prepare for the worst and maintain robust cyber security measures to effectively handle any potential threats. Illegal dumping is a common problem. The deadly waste can blow into pastoral lands where it is eaten by livestock. Without a centralized recycling program, some 90% of it ends up in landfills. Since 2018, local NGO Ecosum has organized one of the area's first recycling facilities, encouraging herders and others to pick up local waste and bring it to them for processing. Partially funded by the EU, the NGO is trying to establish Mongolia's first zero waste district. Angles and 
For Narambad, work starts bright and early, when he and his colleagues head out to collect waste from those who can't bring it to the facility themselves. They then separate the plastics into what can be reused and what can't. The plastic is then pressed into one-ton cubes, placed on a truck and sent to the capital Alambatar for processing. The Mongolia introduced a ban on single-use plastic bags in 2019. But it remains one of the world's top per capita producers of plastic waste. Annual plastics production worldwide has more than doubled in 20 years to 460 million tons and is on track to triple within four decades if left unchecked. For Mongolian Herder, individual habits need to change. Antnas yatar kam tim huni o kumsur ayu o kan gejvest. Tim ostras teri ge lerin purun hinchigir ur garutsla in dilhi der ander chagin ho de ur garutsla o kumsur lat tege jo ander khel hirkte wagamulta. For Barmunk said he felt everyone needed to play a role in helping make Earth a better place. In a rustic Malaysian workshop about a century old and cluttered with racks of tires, a stoic, white-haired man dressed in a t-shirt and shorts inspects his nearly finished trishaw. Chu Yu Chun is a veteran craftsman of pedicabs and is said to be the last one still plying the disappearing trade on Penang Island, north of Malaysian capital Kuala Lumpur. Make the new one and the last one. If uh, the pair, and I got that, uh, normally the pair, bicycle shop also can repair. The, the chain tire, chain the spare bike can repair one. Only make the new one difficult. Huh? Trishaws, or pedal-driven taxis, were once common in Malaysia and elsewhere in the region. Their popularity has declined as modern transport systems were built in tandem with the region's economic development. But he intends to retire in a few years. So I plan new four years I pension. I had to clear my stock to three or four years, then I pension. The fourth generation in a family of trishaw builders dating back about a century. Chu took over in the late 1980s after his father suffered health issues. As there is hardly any interest in using them for actual transport, Chu's finished orders end up as decorations or collectibles. Any, uh, they, some come for business, some hotel, some is uh, buy back home. Uh, interesting, uh, and then we buy back one. All, all handwood. All handwood. Like, like the front body is one, one piece of one piece of wood to, to fitting one. 
ปุดกรรมเน้นเมตัวเวอร์ฮัตตูเวลิงปัตตุปะนะ Already acquainted with fitting tire tubes as a teenager, he picked up the art of building frames from scratch. The steel bodies of Chu's machines are bent and welded piece by piece, along with each model's wooden seating area, before being fitted with factory-made items such as the hubs and chain. If you continue work that about 20 days, 20 days, but I. I have to repair, and then uh, roughly about six six weeks. He rolls out three to four pedicabs annually, selling them for 7,500 ringgit, or almost 1,600 US dollars. Order is order less, then you have to expenses too much. You have to pay the renting, electrical. The one is already 2,000 plus. There are just over 130 trishels in Penang, where they differ in style from the few dozen found in the southern state of Malacca, where the vehicles remain popular among tourists. Malacca's trishels are designed to have their rider sit beside their passengers, while Penang handlers pedal from behind. None of Chu's children are interested in trishaws, nor is he keen to teach them as it involves a lot of hard work and spare parts that are hard to find. He got a job, then he get to the university, then he got a good job. What for come and continue? My son also didn't continue. And he is looking forward to his retirement. malicious and false statements spread by SMS or social media platforms have become too widespread. The public is advised to be careful and not fall for such ploys and sharing or forwarding such messages. Remember that spreading fake news is an offense under Section 233 of the Communications and Multimedia Act 1998. This carries a penalty of a fine not exceeding 50,000 ringgit or up to one year imprisonment or both upon conviction. In a small Cambodian town near the banks of the Mekong River, law student Owen Bunth of tenses his slender torso and steals himself for an elbow strike to his head. Bunth of is among 20 young Cambodians at an open air club in Krong Araksat training in the ancient Khmer combat martial art of Yat Krong Korm. The practice was largely forgotten after many of its masters were killed in a purge of intellectuals under the communist Khmer Rouge between 1975 and 1979, but Bunthov and his fellow students are determined to learn its techniques and keep their heritage alive. For the students, who wear headbands and arm ties, the training includes learning to launch knockout blows with fists, high-powered precision kicks and rapid elbow and knee strikes. Stick, sword, and spear fighting are also on the curriculum. Yat Kromkom, which translates to the art of war in the Khmer language, 
was born out of the numerous wars fought by the ancient Khmer Empire. It has three components, the art of war, magic spells, and military strategy. He explaining that the ART's techniques were refined and perfected by warriors over time. In the early 2000s, some of the old Yuk Kronkorn masters emerged from the shadows and began to showcase the little-known martial art. It was introduced to the Cambodian military and some universities, but remained largely unknown to the public, who are more familiar with Khun Khmer kickboxing and another ancient martial art, Bokata. ចាំហើយក្បាច់គុនយុទ្ធក្រមខំ <coughs> Student Mao Rida, 18, who has trained for around two years, hopes to use her skills to protect herself from bad people. She also appealing to young people, especially girls, to take it up. At the club, Bantha's opponent darts forward and in one swift, simultaneous movement, hops up and lands a ruthless mock strike. Bunthav, who is in his third year of his legal studies, has been practicing Yuk Kronkorn for only two months, but the training has already helped to reduce his stress levels and made him healthier.